church. Let's go ahead and stand. We're going to start praising God. Amen. Jesus brought us in victory. Victory through death and through life. Amen? Amen. Let's sing it with all of our hearts. Amen? I heard a good old story how the Savior came from glory how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning and his precious blood atoning and I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him, and all my love is to him. He brought me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come here, my good spirit. I then obeyed his blessed commands, gave the victory. Oh yes, oh victory, Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the freezing flood. I heard about the mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the street of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story, and some sweet day I see my perfect song the victory. Come on, oh victory, Jesus, my Savior forever. He 
sought me and fought me, for his redeeming blood. He loved me, I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. One time, oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and fought me, for his redeeming blood. He loved me, I knew him. My love is to him. He brought me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. Let's let's have a seat. Good morning, church. If it's your first time coming here, if you're hundred times coming here, we want to welcome you to the Heartland Church of Christ. Amen. And uh, it's so good to be together this morning and really get to experience God the way he deserves to be experienced. Love him, praise him, worship him, and have a great fellowship together. Amen? Amen. We're going to start off with the word of God. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. And there it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. If you're here this morning, grace and peace to you. I'm going to let my wife share and then we pray and continue with our service. Good morning. Uh, I was just, it's been so good. I love that song. I, it made me think of memories of me growing up in church and I was just a victory in Jesus. That's beautiful. And I was just thinking about that is the victory that we have, this grace and peace from God. You know, as Paul greeted the church in Ephesus, he also, we also want to welcome you and, and welcome you this morning, those online and here with us today. You know, even though the church in Ephesus and all the churches, you know, that Paul writes letters to were imperfect, sinful, missing the mark kind of people, right? But he calls them God's perfect, holy, and God's people, holy and faithful in Christ Jesus. You know, it sounds familiar, right? We too are imperfect people. But God sees us as holy, set apart, and faithful. He goes on to express, you know, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First and foremost, God is about grace and peace. You know, there is no other God like our God. Most gods of this world are about power, self-preservation, and oppression. But our God is about self-sacrifice and offers us grace and peace. So we want to say grace and peace to you again from God our Father. You know, and so as we worship him, let us remember his goodness and give him the praise and glory. May we live our lives to honor him, to imitate him, imitate his love and compassion to the rest of the world. So just wanted to share those with you today. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love that endures forever. Lord, I'm grateful to you because we even, before we even say anything, you already know what we're going to say. But you listen, you care, you have compassion on all of us. I pray that this morning, worship can bring joy to your heart. And that everything that we do is to your liking and your glory. We love you. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Let's stand. of all creation of water, earth and sky the heavens are your tabernacle glory to the Lord on high God of 
Good morning, church. Now it's part of our service where we come together and take part in communion. My name is Ted, and I have the honor this morning to lead us in our thoughts in communion. You know, communion is taken as a remembrance of Jesus. And the reason why we do this so often is because it's a big deal. We think of what Jesus did for us. You know, you can turn with me here to Isaiah 52. And just in this small excerpt here in verse 14, it says, Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being. And his form mirrored beyond human likeness. And if we move on one more page to chapter 53, verse 4 and 5, it says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we consider him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. And not long after that, in verse 7 it says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. 
and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Amen. And, and this kind of imagery is what I hope we can gain from communion, what we can just remember Jesus like. You know, every day outside of these church walls, do we remember Jesus with the choices we make? You know, do we honor Jesus? Do we remember Jesus? Now, if you will, turn with me to Hebrews 12. We're going to jump into verse 1 and 3. And it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such oppositions from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Amen. For communion this morning, brothers and sisters, let us consider what can we do to remember Jesus. Because if we fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, we can persevere through anything. You know, we take communion not because we forget who Jesus is, but to focus our eyes on him. You know, to give him, to give and to put our attention on him. You know, we have all sorts of things happening in our lives that we can be so easily caught up with and distracted with. But just this morning, let's cast those off, put those aside, and focus on what's truly important. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity for us to gather here, God, for, for this moment for which we are about to partake, God, the bread and the juice, God, the bread that represents your body that died for us on the cross, God, and the blood that you shed for us. God, we are so incredibly thankful for all that you do for us and your sacrifices that you make for us. Yet we don't deserve any of that. I pray that we can just reflect back, not only on this time in communion, but in our lives, God. As we leave these walls, God, I pray that we can do things in honor of you and just live our lives for you. We thank you so much for all that you do. Pray for our great service. We love you. We say this in your son's name. Amen.
Amen. And now it's time in our service where we take up offering. Um, We'll have ushers bring out the basket and feel free to give out of your heart. Um, I just want to share a thought with you. You know, just like God had sacrificed his son, Jesus, for us, um, consider what little that we can offer and sacrifice and give back, you know, to to God, to the church, um, to whoever needs it whether it's time, where it's a dinner out with someone, or just a conversation, you know, I encourage you guys to give up those offerings to, to sacrifice. Um, if you want to give monetarily, we have two baskets in the back there that you can give, as well as tidely if you want to give online as well. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love for us, God. Thank you for your son that you sacrificed for us, God. Thank you for all your love that you pour for us and all the wealth that you bring to us, God. Thank you for this building, God, for just us to even be here and to just to gather and worship your name, God, and to, to do it so freely and safely, God. We're so incredibly thankful for that. God, I pray that you know, we look intently into our heart to consider what we can give back to you, God. Um, all the things that you provide for us, it's not ours, it's yours, God. And so I pray that we can lift those up and, and give it back to you, God. Um, so we're incredibly thankful for all of it. We love you, God. We say all this in your son's name. Amen. 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 All right, as those baskets are being passed, uh, I am going to walk us through some announcements uh, with a little help from Danielle. So we have five announcements total. She's handling the last one. So hang in there. Okay, guys? Uh, Yeah, Douglas is excited. Okay, so uh, a few weeks ago, uh, not this past Wednesday or the Wednesday before that, but the Wednesday before that, uh, we talked here uh, at our congregational midweek about fall into fitness, okay? Uh, you know, this awesome push for us to, to want to just take a step in the direction of being a little bit more healthy, or a lot more healthy. Amen, right? Uh, well, uh, in accordance with that, in response to that, we're going to have a, a bulletin board, I believe, in that back hallway, uh, like where the bathrooms are. Uh, and so if you want, uh, no one's forced to do any of this, okay? But if you want, you can write down a goal or goals that you have on some little sticky notes that are over there uh, and then put them up on the board. And then everybody can pray uh, for those goals. Uh, and uh, that'll be an awesome time. Amen? So uh, if you have any goals or if you want to make any goals, uh, make sure to do that. Uh, second, uh, the Bible study uh, with Harold is back next Sunday, okay, 8.30. If you're available, please go out there. Uh, they're going to be covering out there. I say they because I have to be in here for worship, but uh, they'll, they'll be handling a lot of the stuff in Revelation that we won't get to during our Sunday services. So uh, just if you want the full picture as full as possible, make sure to make it uh, over there at 8.30 next Sunday. Amen. Uh, and then uh, also for that same uh, Revelation series, we have books out at the book table. Those are $14, so make sure if you ordered one, go pick up your book. If you didn't order one, there's extras, so you can pay $14 and go pick those up. Uh, That'll be awesome. It's a great looking book. I haven't actually opened it yet, but I'm going to, okay? Uh, So that'll be good. And then lastly for me, uh, Monster Mash is coming up, which is so exciting. Awesome time for our church to host uh, teens from all over the Heartland region. So Uh, We still need volunteers, and we still need people to sign up for housing. Uh, So the the lovely, beautiful Katie Werner, uh, my wife, is going to be out there uh, with a sign-up. So please come by. If you even walk in the vicinity, she's going to come and ask you. So be ready uh, for that, okay? Uh, But we need more people to sign up for those things. So uh, that's all I had. Danielle's got one more. Good morning, church. So yesterday, I don't, so Brandon and I help lead uh, kids ministry, and with that, we really have tried to, this year, strive to have family time, youth and family time from cradle to career. So 
babies to high school and then off you know to wherever they go after that so yesterday we got to do host a fall festival with a chili cook-off and we had some pumpkin painting we had some pinatas there were many of you guys there it was so encouraging so awesome so cool to see the kids getting to paint pumpkins i think we left some of ours out there because we didn't want to take them in our car they were a little wet um and so but we just had a good time uh it was pretty cool i'm going to speak on my daughter a little bit like watching her eat that donut like the the tech tactic she had on winning that was pretty awesome I kept watching the video over and over again um, and then so Karina uh, designed this really cool pinata and it held up the best it was amazing all the kids loved it and so I just want to encourage you guys when we have these times feel free to come if you are a part of this ministry because it is really encouraging and so with that we had a competition um, so there were five chilies that were entered in the contest. Mine was one. Um, I will. So I did not tell anybody which one was mine. Uh, Karina also entered one. And she, uh, let's see, there was Bev, there was Katie Moore, there was Daryl, and then, yeah, mine. So we entered chilies in, and uh, the second place winner was Beverly Ozan. And then our first place winner was Karina. And so that's so cool because she was encouraging me to buy gifts for people. Like she was just like, hey, we need to buy gifts for people because she really wanted to pour out love to everyone. And then she ended up winning. And it was such, like I was the one that picked it out. So she didn't even pick it out. But I picked it out. And I was like, that was such a cool gift. And what a way to honor her and her time of really serving our ministry and giving and planning it so if uh if we will have more of these times but i just really want to encourage everybody and we'll have a slideshow because we have really cool pictures as well um and so that will be posted sometime soon uh but i want to encourage you guys all that it's a really fun time for us all to get together so all right let's stand for one last song before the sermon
Yeah, you can be seated. Amen. Good morning. Give me a second to catch my breath after that song. <laughs> ah. Thanks, bro. It is great to be together uh, once again. Welcome to Heartland Church. Um, I don't know if I have control here of the PowerPoint. Let's see. All right. Welcome. Uh, we're studying out the book of Revelation uh, for the next eight or so weeks. And so, um, first of all, I do, again, want to just welcome everyone. And uh, it's great to be together. Always great to come and worship God, to take communion together. Uh, I love seeing the, the preteens up here. They're at class now, but just seeing the girls up here dancing during the songs and just, just worshiping God is always a great time. Amen? Amen. Uh, but as I said, we are studying out the book of Revelation. If you weren't here last week, I really want to encourage you, go back and listen to the lesson, because we did a lot of groundwork. We, we just kind of went through a whole lot that's going to set us up for our series and also set you up to be able to really understand some of the things that are happening in the book. You know, the book of Revelation, it's one of the most misunderstood, one of the most misinterpreted, uh, one of the most feared you know, some people, I just don't even want to read it because I don't know what's going on. There's all kinds of beasts and dragons and all that stuff. And, and so one of our goals is to really help as a church to understand what's going on, to understand how to read the book of Revelation. And so uh, we talked about last week, these first two weeks, we're doing an intro and overview. But there's a lot in that. It's not your typical intro like, oh, here's what we're doing. There's a lot that we're going to cover. Today, we're going to get into numerology and symbolism that we see in the book of Revelation. Uh, the numerology, we're not talking about like superstition of numbers. This is like numbers meant something to them, all right? So that's what I mean by numerology. Uh, well, then we're going to spend five weeks looking at the message to the churches. There were seven churches in Revelation. We'll talk about those. Uh, then finally, we'll wrap up with one other lesson. Um, as mentioned, Harold will be covering more of the book in his Sunday morning Bible study, so please come to that if you're able and also get uh, Gordon Ferguson's book, which will really help fill in all the gaps of what we do here on Sundays. A few quick reminders for those that weren't here last week. Who wrote the book of Revelation? It was the Apostle John, okay? Apostle John wrote it, and who did he write it to? It was mostly Jewish Christians, okay? That's really important to understand that. He didn't write it to 21st century Americans in Arkansas, and if we have a 21st century Arkansas American lens on, we're going to misunderstand some things. So we've got to kind of put ourselves in the shoes of these early Christians. Specifically, he wrote to seven churches that are listed. These are actual churches that existed back in those days. You can visit these cities now where these churches existed. So that's who he wrote these to. Um, and why did he do this? It was to encourage them in light of the coming persecution. They were already facing persecution from the Jews that weren't Christians, and it was about to ramp up because they were going to face, face this intense persecution from Rome. Uh, when was it written? It was written toward the end of the first century. And, uh, but, it, but he said, when he wrote this, he said, these things will soon take place. He said, do not seal up the words of this prophecy. This is not for some far off time. This is going to happen now. It said, the time is near. So today, we're going to dig into some of this symbolism and numerology that we see in Revelation. And there's a couple of things that you, I'm sure you've heard about, and we're going to kind of help understand what is going on in that book. Now, much of the book, the, the word Revelation, by the way, the, the um, Greek word is apocalypsis, all right? This is where we get the word apocalypse, okay? The language that they use, it's apocalyptic language. So it's a figurative language. Language, And that's what we're going to look at a lot today is what, what were some of these symbols and these figurative uh, languages that we see in this book. At the end of the uh, lesson last week, I gave an example and I read this account of a Razorback game. And I used kind of some of the slang that we would use today, you know, about the O-line and the defense and the Razorbacks and the Catamounts. And, and I, I, you know, I showed this image and if, if you just took word for word what I said 2,000 years from now, you're going to get some really crazy images in your mind. What in the world is a Razorback? And what is all this stuff? What's a touchdown? And did they cut touchdown out of the sky? And we understand what all that means, right? 2,000 years from now, they probably wouldn't understand that, especially the way that the Razorbacks are playing. Nobody's going to understand. <laughs> Sorry. They're, they're awesome. I love the Razorbacks. I'm, I'm a fan. Um, so anyway, sometimes in the Bible, in, in Revelation, we're given an exact clear 
interpretation of what those symbols are. And so we're going to look at some easy ones first. Then we'll get into some that are a little trickier, all right? So um, let's look at one. Uh, here's a, a map of where those churches were, okay? So you see the seven churches there. It's in modern-day Turkey, okay? Uh, we talked about apocalyptic language. Now let's jump to Revelation 1, verse 12. Revelation 1, 12. We're going to really move through today, but uh, the scriptures for the most part will be up here and the lessons recorded, so you can go back and, and absorb more on your own if you want. Revelation 1 and verse 12, <clears throat> John says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. Dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. Coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. Man, here we see this incredible imagery. I mean, you could just break it down word by word. Some of these images that we see, it says, we see someone like the Son of Man. Anyone recognize that reference? Jesus, throughout the Gospels, called himself the Son of Man, right? Where did he get that from? It's from Daniel. If you look in the Old Testament, Daniel used that exact phrase, the Son of Man. So here we see John saying, I saw someone like the Son of Man. His hair was white like wool. His eyes were blazing like fire there was a double-edged sword coming out of his mouth anybody recognize that reference Hebrews right Hebrews 4 it says the word of God is living and active sharper than a double-edged sword so when you see this image of Jesus we don't literally think there was a sword coming you know yeah a sword out of his mouth it's like no the word of God was coming out of his mouth that sharp double-edged sword so you start to see this symbolism really coming to life you know, one of the images that's prominent here, and we see in other places in Revelation, are these seven golden lampstands, right? And that's, that's what we would picture, right? Seven golden lampstands. But <clears throat> what were the lampstands? What was this talking about? Was it literally seven lampstands? It's like, okay, what, what, who cares? There's lampstands, right? Well, let's find out exactly what these lampstands represented. Let's keep reading. Uh, look down in verse 17. <clears throat> it says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Okay? John gives us this easy one right here. It's like, okay, the seven lampstands, the seven stars, it's literally the seven stars were seven angels that oversaw those churches, that looked over them. Some uh, historians think that it just meant the completeness of God's angels, the completeness of the, the heavenly host was watching over the churches. But then these seven lampstands represent the seven churches. You think about a lampstand. What does a lamp do? It, it shines light, right? It, it brings illumination. The church, we are called to let our light shine. We see the symbolism explained. And, and again, this is an easy one, right? So we're going to look at some more symbolism today. And some of these are really easy. Some of them it just says, hey, this is what this means. Other ones we got to dig a little bit more. And so this is going to be helpful as we read through Revelation on our own. To, to start to understand, okay, what does all of this mean? So let's look at some other key symbols. Uh, for time's sake, we may not read all of the scripture references, but you can go back and read those on your own. And I want to encourage you, be a Berean, okay? In the book of Acts, the Bereans were lifted up because they didn't just listen to Paul and what he said. They went and checked it out, made sure it was true, amen? So I'm calling you guys to be Bereans. Let's look at another example here. This is another easy one because we're told what it is. Revelation 5 and verse 8. <clears throat> this is one of my favorites. Revelation 5 and verse 8, it says, And when he had taken it, 
the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Man, what a cool image that we see here. He says they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. You think about when you pray, that, that your prayers, our, our prayers as a church, are just this, this incense, this fragrant aroma that just kind of wafts up to God. You know, if we could really see that, if we could see our prayers just floating up and connecting with God, God's just like, oh man, Carlos is praying. Man, that, that smells so good. Man, Ben is just is, is praising my name right now. Man, that smells good, right? There, there's a lot of stuff in the world that doesn't smell so good. Incense smells good, right? And, and that's your prayer, just wafting up to God. If you could see that, would you pray more? Would you pray more fervently if you just pictured this image of God just, just soaking up your prayers? That's one of the images that we see here in Revelation. Amen? <clears throat> All right, now we're going to see another image. This one is not as, as pleasant, okay? Um, we're talking about the beast. You guys heard of the beast in Revelation, right? We're, we're told there that there's a ten-horned beast in Revelation. Now, we're going to look back at some scriptures in Daniel because Daniel helps to illuminate what this beast is and some other beasts as well, and that'll help us to understand Revelation. Remember, the early Jewish Christians, they knew the Old Testament. They knew all the language that was used, and so to them, they're like, oh, the ten-horned beast. Yeah, Daniel talked about that, right? So, um, I will say this. Political entities were often shown as animals or beasts, okay? When you look in the scriptures, and, and we're going to see it right in Daniel— so when you hear of a beast or some kind of animal, a lot of times that was referring to, to a, a nation or an empire or sometimes a king, right? Um, so let's look. Look back in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7. <clears throat> We're going to read a chunk here because it really illuminates the beast. <clears throat> Daniel 7 and verse 1. <clears throat> It says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. <clears throat> Daniel said, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion. And it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being. And the mind of a human was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision, at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. Man, these are some frightening images, right? These great beasts, one's like a lion, one's like a leopard, one is a bear. And you just see these images and you're like, man, it, it, I'm starting to picture these, these monsters, right? But what does all this really mean? And so we're going to keep reading because Daniel's going to really explain exactly what these mean. Um, look down, we're going to jump down to verse 13. It says, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one, here you go, like a son of man. Remember that? We just talked about that in Revelation. Coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days, that's Father God, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. 
man, you see this imagery, and, and really, if you study this out, we see a lot of this on, in Acts, right? When, when Peter preached that first sermon after Jesus had risen, and all nations came together, right? And, and the Holy Spirit came down on them, and we see this vision. That's the kingdom. That's what he's talking about. This kingdom that will never be destroyed. Let's read on, verse 15. He says, I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I, I bet. <laughs> I approached one of those standing there and asked him, what's the meaning of all this? So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth. But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Then I wanted to know the meaning of this fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying with its iron teeth and bronze claws. The beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot what was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before three of them fell. The horn that looked more imposing than the others and the eyes and the mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them until the ancient of days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the most high and the time came when they possessed the kingdom we read on verse 23 it says he gave me this explanation the fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on the earth it will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth trampling it down and crushing it the ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Man, again, there, there's some crazy stuff here, right? Some crazy imagery being used about these beasts, but then Dan just breaks it down and makes it really simple for us. The beasts are kingdoms. If you go back in history, do you know who was in power at the time of Daniel? We, we said it earlier. Babylon, right? So that was the first beast that we see here. The Babylonian Empire was that beast. And then we see that there's the Medo-Persian Empire that came to power, okay? So after Babylon fell, the Medo-Persians came and they took power. Then Greece was the next empire. So what we see is all three of these things happened before Jesus came, right? Before Peter preached that sermon and had the keys to the kingdom, before any of that happened, these three empires came and went. And then this fourth beast, Daniel didn't know the name of it. He didn't know it was Rome, but he knew it was this ten-horned beast, okay? We're going to see this same beast in the book of Revelation. So, uh, look at this. Daniel actually breaks down two of the kings here. In Daniel 8, verse 19, it said, He said, I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath, because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between its eyes is the first king. So he literally tells us, this is is what's going to happen. These two kingdoms are going to rise, they're going to fall, and a fourth and more terrifying kingdom is going to rise. Make sense? So, so again, if, if you just read it at face value in a literal interpretation, you're thinking, man, there's going to be these monsters running around the earth. And it's like, no, these, these are kingdoms that will come. You can go back and look in history, the succession of these kingdoms happened exactly like we were told. What's really cool about that to me is it just builds my faith in God's word. How did Daniel know? How did Daniel have this vision and knew this was going to happen and this was going to happen? Even the ten horns, if you really get into the, the Roman Empire, there were ten main emperors of Rome. There were some other little minor emperors that kind of got pushed to the wayside. But, but those ten emperors, you see it all lived out in history. You know, sometimes people will say, well, the Bible was just made up by men. I don't know, man. There, there's stuff like this that, that when you see it come true, it's like there's no way a group of men over centuries conspired to put all that together. We, we couldn't even do that now. If, if a group of us got together and tried to set something up for the next couple centuries, right. We're doing good to like do a week, right, <laughs> of getting our schedules in line and stuff. 
So anyway, we see this image of the beast. Now remember, Daniel was told this in uh, 826. It says, the vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been given to you is true, but seal up the vision for it concerns the distant future. Okay? We talked about this last week because Daniel was told to seal up his visions for a far off time. Well, that happened over the next four to five hundred years. It all came to fruition, what Daniel was talking about. In Revelation, John was told, don't seal up your vision because the time is at hand, okay? We talked, you got to go back and listen, but we got into last week the timeline of Revelation and how sometimes we've been taught like, oh, this is going to, this is the end of the world. This was written for the 21st century. It literally says the time is at hand. Amen. So there you have the four beasts. The lion with wings was Babylon. The bear with three ribs in his mouth was Medo-Persia. The leopard with four wings was Greece. And the terrifying beast with the ten horns is Rome. <clears throat> Man, that frightening image is not quite the frightening image that we get when we really understand what is going on. But I'll say this. This beast might be terrifying. I think the actual beasts that we face are more terrifying. You know, the Bible says, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14, that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. <laughs> Think about it. If this beast was walking down the road, are you going to worship that beast? Probably not, right? You're going to run from it. You're going to be freaking out and get out of there. But, but you know what? The, the things that we face in this world, like power, sex, money, material things, Man, those beasts, the things that the beast offers us are are way more terrifying than this. They they do way more damage. They don't just devour us physically. They they devour our souls if we let them. Amen? So when you hear about the beast, don't think about some scary monster. Think about just the, the things in our world that the beast is offering us today. Now, let's talk about the Antichrist. Okay, this is another image that we see in Revelation. I remember being a kid, and I don't know why my parents let me watch this movie. I'm not even going to say the name because it was bad, right? But there was this guy that came. He was supposed to be the Antichrist, and it freaked me out. I was probably like seven, right? And I'm like, oh, the Antichrist is coming. And let, let me ask you guys this. How many times do you think the Antichrist is mentioned in Revelation? Anybody know? Once? Zero. Somehow, the Antichrist, we think that's Revelation, right? It's talking about the Antichrist. He's going to come and the mark of the beast and all this. It's never even mentioned in the book of Revelation. Five times we see the Antichrist mentioned, and it's all from John, okay? But it's in John's letters to the churches. And we'll look at a couple of these references now. And this will really help, I think, take some of the mystique of who is it going to be, right? Um, Growing up, I, I heard, well, it was Hitler, right? I mean, back before I was born. Um, then it was Gorbachev, right? And Saddam Hussein, he was the Antichrist. And I'm sure today they'd say someone else. And I've heard it be this president or that president from both parties, right? And we all know who the Antichrist is. No, let's read who the Antichrist is. Second John 1, verse 7. <clears throat> and let me say this, too. If somebody tells you different than what the Bible says, I wouldn't really put a lot of faith in that person's, you know, teaching. Um, 2 John 1, 7, it says, I say this because many deceivers who did not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Look at another one in 1 John 4, 1 through 3. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. So we see that the Antichrist was not some singular figure in history. Not one king or one president or one whatever. It it was anyone who denied that Jesus came in the flesh or that Jesus was the Christ. So in the first century, they started having this group that was rising up among Christianity called the Gnostics. Okay, They thought that anything material was bad. Only spirit matters. And so they thought Jesus couldn't have come in the flesh because that would have been bad, right? Because he couldn't have been flesh. 
So they were denying that Jesus came in the flesh. And John says, anybody that says that, that is the Antichrist. That is the spirit of the Antichrist, a false prophet, a deceiver. You know what happened with the Gnostics, though, because they thought that the flesh, it, only spirit mattered, then they started to justify sin. Like, well, we can do whatever we want in the flesh because all that matters is spirit, right? And, and so they got this twisted theology that, that crept into the church, and I think it can even creep into the church today where people think, you know, it's sin. It's not really that bad, you know. You, you can sleep with that person that you're not married to as long as you love them, Right? We, you, can do, you can lie, little white lies, that's okay, as long as your heart is good, right? Follow your heart, trust your heart. Man, we see these same things that the Gnostics had today, sometimes in the church. So, what we've learned so far, the beast, it's not some scary monster, right, that's going to come and get you. It's, it's the Roman Empire was the fourth and final beast, but I think, you know, there's beasts today in the same realm. Um, the Antichrist wasn't a singular guy or girl. It, it was anyone who denied that Christ had come in the flesh. And so we're going to look at a few other things here, and we'll come back um, to some other of those scary things that we see in Revelation and help understand those. Um, let's talk about some other symbolism. Let's talk about colors for a minute, okay? Colors carried meaning in apocalyptic writing, okay? So in the book of Revelation, you'll hear different colors mentioned of, of different things, and we'll look at some of those. But they meant something to those early Christians. And, and we do the same today. So, for instance, if I told you that I was feeling blue today, what do you think that means? Sad, depressed, right? Now, if you just took that for face value, you might get that image on the left. Like, oh, he said he was feeling blue. You know, someone hears this message 2,000 years from now, and they're going to picture a smurf or something, right? And, and we're all like, no, no, no. It, it just means he was down he was discouraged he was depressed right and so it's the guy on the right that's what it meant by feeling blue okay so you understand we have we have symbolism even for colors today well then you see this image in the book of revelation in chapter six the four horsemen okay this is another one of those terrifying things that you know are there literally going to be these these guys on horses with swords and bows and all this stuff coming and again this is symbolic of things that were about to happen in the first and second century. Revelation 6, the first horse we see, well, first of all, horses, they were symbols of might or strength, okay? So whenever there was a horse used in imagery, it, it meant, you know, that the king came riding on a horse. He was powerful, strong, mighty, okay? So you, you've got that image, but then we get these colors for each horse. The first one was white. White stood for purity. White stood for the gospel being preached. The good news. In Revelation 6, we're just, I'll just read these for time's sake. It says, actually here I have scripture. It says, I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown. And he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. The white horse represented the gospel being preached. The gospel going out into the world that started with Jesus and then in Acts 2. The second horse was the red horse, okay? Revelation 6 and verse 4. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. The red horse, it represented bloodshed. Whenever the gospel is preached, there will be bloodshed. There will be persecution. If, if, as a church, if we really preach the gospel, we will be persecuted. Jesus said, if you preach, you will be persecuted because of me. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. You know, we don't like persecution. We don't face the persecution right now that they were facing, right? Our life is not on the line here in America, in Arkansas, but it could be one day. One day we may face things that, that people in other countries right now are facing. There are countries in the world where the gospel cannot be preached publicly. In fact, they can't sing the song. We sang Victory in Jesus. If they sang that in their house or their apartment, someone overheard them, they could be thrown in jail. The red horse represented persecution and bloodshed. Then we see the black horse. Revelation 6, it's verse uh, 5. It says, I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales 
in his hands. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and wine. The black horse represented famine and economic hardship. Okay? You see that there, think two pounds of wheat for a day's wages? You work all day and you get a couple sacks of flour, a couple bags. You work all day and you get, you get some barley. So the black horse, after you had the gospel preached, and then the persecution, the bloodshed came, and one of the ways that persecution came was in, in economic means, all right? Man, you cut off money, people start to submit to what you want them to do. And we're going to talk about this more in a, in a little bit, how Rome used the power of the purse to really persecute the Christians. That was the black horse. Finally, there was a pale horse, Revelation 6 and verse 8. It says, I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. You know, the word here for pale horse, it's chloros in the Greek, where we get the word chlorophyll, right? Chlorophyll is in plants, it's this green. So when you see the pale horse, it was kind of this sickly green color. You think about like a a zombie or something, you know, whatever color you would picture, it's, it's death, right? This, this green, putrid color, that's what the pale horse represented, was death. So you had the gospel being preached, you had bloodshed, persecution coming, you had the famine, economic hardship, and then finally, death came. Let's look at another symbol, the seven seals, all right? You guys have heard of the seven seals of Revelation. Gordon will get into that a lot in his book. These weren't the Navy seals. They're not animals, right? But they were seals that were being opened, okay? Um, and the reason that things were sealed up was to hide a message, okay? A king would send a letter. He would put a seal on it. That was his official seal, and that seal could only be opened by the recipient of the letter. Well, in Revelation, we learn the only one that could open the seals was Jesus. Jesus could open the seals. And so that's what the seals were. They were just things that were sealed up. Jesus was going to open and reveal, revelation, reveal those things to us. Uh, we'll talk about the trumpets, okay? You see the trumpets, the seven trumpets in Revelation. Um, in Ezekiel, we see what the trumpets are. Ezekiel 33, 5 and 6. Since they heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not heed the warning, their blood will be on their own head. If they had heeded the warning, they would have saved themselves. So trumpets represented a warning, a, a, a siren going off. You know, we use that verbiage today. Man, he didn't hear the red flags going off, or he didn't see, you know, see the red flags, or hear the siren going off. It meant a warning, okay? Now, will there literally be a trumpet? Could be, but, but it symbolized this warning that was going out. All right? Okay, um, now we're going to jump into some stuff that, that's pretty interesting as well, and that's the numerology. I talked earlier about how numbers represented certain things in the book of Revelation. And again, sometimes people take these numbers as a literal thing, and that is a, an incorrect, I believe, interpretation um, in many cases. So, um, we use numbers today to represent things. Anybody think of a number that means something in our culture today? Seven, seven right? What does seven mean? Lucky seven, right? Okay, what is another one? Anybody? 13, right? I mean, there literally have been buildings made. I don't know if they still do this, but they will skip the 13th floor because that's unlucky. That's a bad number, right? Um, or number one, what's that mean? The best, right? Man, we're number one. We're the best. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure a girl once told me, I wouldn't date you if you were the last person on earth. She didn't literally mean, well, maybe she did, you know, and in my mind, I'm like, well, hey, so there's a chance, you know. Um, anyway, but uh, let's talk about these numbers, okay? So let's talk with number one. Number one, when we see that in the, in the Bible, but especially in Revelation and apocalyptic writing, it stood for unity. We see examples like this. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Jesus talked about how he and the Father were one, right? He, it's this unity that we see. That's what the number one represented. Number two, it meant strengthening, okay? When Jesus sent out the disciples, how did he send them out? Two by two, because there was strength in that number, right? So this strengthening happened when, when there were two together. Um, Ecclesiastes talks about it, would two become one, you know? And then, guess what? Number three, when you add in that third part of the, the cord, cord of three strands, it was the divine number. So when you see the number three, it represented the divine number, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Four, number four, it was a cosmic 
or world number. Um, you see these examples like the four winds of heaven, right? Uh, we saw that just a minute, in Daniel, a minute ago in Daniel 7. The four corners of the earth, right? We know there's not actually four corners. It just means that that's the earthly, the, the world number, the cosmic number is what four represented. Then we get to seven, okay? That's the one that you guys probably know already. It was the number of perfection. Seven was the number of perfection. So the, when we see the seven churches, the seven angels, the seven lampstands, all these sevens, it just meant the perfect thing. It was, it was perfect, right? The, the perfect number. Um, we see that throughout scriptures as well. Um, the seven, there's seven beatitudes in Revelation. Um, Elijah, when he looked for rain, how many times did he go? Seven. Uh, Naaman, told to dip seven times in the Jordan. Joshua, march around Jericho. How many times? Seven times, right? How many times do you need to forgive your brother? Seven? No, 70 times seven, right? It just means the perfect number. You forgive your brother as many times as it takes. That'd be the perfect number for you, amen? So that's what seven represented. All right, we skipped one, but we're going to go do it now, and that's number six, okay? Six is the number of man. It's one less than seven. It's not perfect. It's a little bit below perfect, right? The number of man, it's lacking. It's just short of seven. It's where the number of the mark of the beast, the 666 comes from, right? It's the number of man. The number of God would be 777, but the mark of the beast is 666. Um, now, people have come up with all sorts of ideas about what the mark of the beast is, right? And, and again, we think in modern terms. Well, I bet it was, you know, 30, 40 years ago, it's credit cards. You get a credit card, that's the mark of the beast. Now they got you, right? They got you with that credit card, and people thought that. Um, or it's microchips. We're all going to get microchips put in us, and that'll be the mark of the beast. And, and then it, maybe people thought tattoos, you know, you get a tattoo, that's the mark of the beast. Um, all these different theories have been out there. Even recently, people said the COVID vaccine, that's the mark of the beast, don't do it, right? And you want to get it or don't get it, do whatever, but it's not the mark of the beast, okay? We're going to talk about what that was. <clears throat> this was an issue for the early church because Rome required emperor worship, okay? If you lived in Rome, in any part of Rome, you were required to say Caesar is Lord. If you didn't say Caesar is Lord, you could lose your livelihood, you could lose your life. There were times when people had their families put to death because they would not confess Caesar is Lord. At one point, they had papers. So if you confess Caesar is Lord, you would get these papers. And, and that is believed to be the mark of the beast was you confessing to the beast, the beast is Lord, not Jesus is Lord. Okay? So the mark of the beast, it's, it's not this, this chip or whatever. It just literally means you're bowing down to the beast. Now, I would submit today, we could still have the mark of the beast. We don't have Rome, but we can still bow down to things of this world. We can bow down to nations of this world or, or peoples of this world or the culture or whatever it is that, that it is. We, if we bow down to it, we're, we're basically doing the same thing that they were warned not to do. Amen? Mark of the beast. Uh, ten. Ten represented completeness, okay? You got ten fingers, most of us, hopefully. Ten toes. Maybe you got eleven. You're, you're more complete, I guess. Um, but ten represented completeness, right? And then you have the number of thousand. We see this come up in the Bible. Um, it's a multiple of ten, all right? So ten meant complete. So ten times ten times ten. It's just the ultimate completeness. Completely complete, if you will. And you see examples of that, that God keeps his covenant to a thousand generations. Doesn't mean if there's a thousand and first generation, God ends his covenant. It just means forever. God's going to keep his covenant to, to the completeness. Um, cattle of a thousand hills. God owns the thousand and first as well, right? But, but it just means this complete number. We use things today like that. You know, if you say a million, we use that to mean just that. That's, it's this large number that just means all-encompassing, right? Man, he's, a, he's got millions. He's a billionaire, whatever. So that's the way they use the number 1,000. <clears> the number 12, it was the number of organized religion. Excuse me. You see this <clears throat> in the Old Testament, the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Um, the New Testament, the 12 tribes. Apostles. When one of the apostles died, Judas died, he took his own life, they had to replace him. They got back to the 12, right? Um, and in Revelation, we see the 12 tw 
tribes referenced again. Okay, um, moving on here. Three and a half meant a period of persecution. In Daniel, we just read about a time, times, and half a time. Did you catch that when we were reading Daniel? You're like, what? What's a time, times, and half a time? Well, a time would be a year. Times is two years and a half a time. So three and a half years. Also, sometimes it's shown as 42 months, three and a half years, 1260 days, three and a half years. This represented the time of persecution. And if you look at these references, you'll see this persecution is going to come for a time, times and a half a time. You're going to be persecuted for a period of 42 months. Not literal. It's, it's this figurative thing that just means that's the time of persecution. Amen? Um, last number here we got, and then we're almost done. 144,000, right? This is one that, man, you read that in Revelation, and it says the, there's going to be 144,000 sealed. And you think, uh-oh, man, I hope, I'm, like, I hope I'm in the 135 range, you know, or whatever. And, and there have been religious movements that, that preach literally there's only going to be 144,000. And guess what? When that religious movement got over 144,000, they're like, well, those are some special people. But there's still going to be more. You can still get in too, right? And it doesn't mean that. So if we break this down, there were 12 tribes of God's people. In the book of Revelation, it talks about how there'd be 12,000 from this tribe, 12,000 from this tribe. Twelve. So guess what? 12 times 12,000, 144,000. It literally means that the organized religion was the, the number 12 and 1,000 was the completeness. So it just means the completeness of God's people. There's going to be a, a complete amount when all the people that are going to be sealed, and this isn't the seal that was opened. This is like the seal of the Holy Spirit, right? Ephesians 4, you can look that up. talks about how when you were baptized, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. So that's the number 144,000. So last thing I want to talk about here really quickly is the timeline that we see in the book of Revelation, okay? Revelation is not in chronological order, all right? So there's some things that we see in the beginning and then it kind of jumps to some things that are going to happen later. And then, like in Revelation 12 as an example, it jumps back to when Jesus was born, okay? So it, it kind of jumps around, and it's, it's not undifferent than, than some movies. You guys know who that is? Forrest Gump, right? You ever seen it? If you watch this movie, we see this guy, he's a middle-aged guy, and then all of a sudden it goes back to him being a kid. And then it's back to the middle-aged guy. And then he's like a, a teenager, and then it's back to then. And then and it, so if you watch that and you think, wow, this guy, he was old, and then he was young, and then he was old, and then he was young. And so Revelation does the same thing. It's not anything weird. Maybe that's where they got it for Forrest Gump was Revelation. I don't know. But it, it jumps around in the timeline. So if you get confused on that, um, the book is going to help. You can ask somebody else that knows. You ask me, Josh, whoever. Um, but it, it jumps around a lot. And so... Just wanted to make sure you don't read it and think it's in chronological order. And, and that being said, God is not bound by time and space, right? God doesn't have the limits that we have. God can, can do whatever and see whatever and be wherever, whenever he wants. The Bible says a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. God is not bound by time and space and revelation is not either. Amen? So, as we wrap up this morning, the book of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ. It's an amazing book given to John, written to the seven churches in the first century, all of God's people that would be persecuted. It was written with apocalyptic language, full of symbolism. The overall message, God wins in the end, and we better be on his side. Amen? Next week, we're going to start jumping into this message for the seven churches. If you haven't started reading Revelation, read chapter 1, soon because we've already covered that and then uh, next week josh is going to jump into chapter two and then we'll do two and three over the next few weeks amen um if you haven't already read through the book join the sunday morning bible study grab the um the revelation book that we've got out there and uh, let's just really dive in and, and be more and more inspired by god's amazing word amen let's pray and we'll have a closing song father we thank you so much for your amazing word, God. We thank you for that image of Jesus with the double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And, and God, we know that your word cuts into our hearts, God. Your word exposes things in our life that need to come out and, and that we can give you more glory uh, by repenting of those things. And God, I pray that as we read this book that was written to these churches, I, I know it was written for us as well, just to be inspired and encouraged and built up in our faith. 
God, I pray that you give us a, a mind and a heart of understanding. God, I pray that uh, we can just have our faith built more and more as we go. Bless this week. Uh, I pray for everyone sitting here this morning, everyone watching online, that we can just have an amazing week serving you, our great and glorious King. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's go on and stand up. Uh, we're going to sing one last song and then be dismissed. Love this song. Good charge for us to, uh, you know, really live out uh, here am I, send me kind of kind of mentality. Amen. Amen. Amen, you're dismissed.